Um, I got to tell you, we are almost into my least favorite part of the summer season, and summer hasn't even started yet. And if you have kids or have had kids or are responsible for watching kids, you're going to know that what you're coming up on is the it's not fair season. Because as soon as my kids are home for summer break, that's all I hear all day. It's not fair. It's not fair. Even this morning, we're sitting here, and I'm looking through my notes and listening to the worship team as they're practicing, and I have my, my little, little one who's five going, well, I want to go play in the gym, and Jojo, you can't go play in the gym, but that's not fair. <sighs> The reality of that statement is what it does is it it exposes what our thoughts and feelings and actions are when it comes to justice. It's not a question of fair or, or not, it's a question of justice. And also what it exposes is that everyone in reality has their own idea or sense of what justice is. So when it comes to justice and fairness, there's four primary umbrellas that we have in society that we experience every day. We have uh, uh, political justice, social justice, uh, legal justice, economic justice. All of those are the big umbrellas over everything that we experience on a day-to-day basis. And all of these things are thoughts and feelings and actions towards whatever category you want to, to look at or whatever category is currently impacting your life is going to uh, base and influence the decisions that we make. The decisions that we make now, the decisions that we make into the future, and realistically, it's going to impact the decisions that we make into eternity. So this morning, I want to paint justice with a very wide brush. And as we go through, I want to kind of tighten that focus up little by little so we can get to the understanding of three very important truths about justice this morning that we're going to learn from Daniel chapter 5. So I want to start with just a basic definition of justice. Justice is action in accordance with the requirements of some law. Now this is where it gets tricky Because there's a number of worldviews that are conflicting with each other. They maybe bring more questions than they answer. So these frameworks that we have, there's some that are the the top, I would say, maybe four or five are this one. Justice is inherent in nature. It just, it simply exists. Another view of justice is that justice consists of rules. And it's common to all humanity. And it emerges out of consensus. And there's uh, justice is an abstract idea. It sits higher than any legal system of society. And the problem with, with when we look at justice is anything, we can look at this and say, okay, some of these make sense. But what happens is when anything happens outside of these parameters, we would consider it unjust. And these are, are great thoughts about justice, but they're really leaving a lot of questions. Like, who sets the standard? Well, if community can set the standard based on con- con- consensus, that could be scary. Well, who determines injustice? Well, if it's inherent in nature, I guess it doesn't matter. Anybody can. Or questions like, what determines the punishment? Who determines the punishment? Who punishes? How do violations get punished? So what I want to kind of submit to you this morning as we we look at all this, I think that there is one very specific worldview that answers all those questions, and it's this, that justice stems from God's will or command as it depends on his character and nature. We're going to see that in our story this morning as we're looking at Daniel chapter 5. If you've read it beforehand, if you're familiar with it, you know that uh, Nebuchadnezzar's rule has come to an end, and now we're introduced to Belshazzar, who's the new king, and uh, he's the Chaldean king, and uh, they're having a big celebration, and and, uh, Belshazzar's chapter as the king and ruler is not very long. We see a lot about Nebuchadnezzar in the earlier chapters, and then we hit chapter 5, and it's this real brief snapshot of Belshazzar. And we're introduced to him as he's throwing this big party with all his wives and all his nobles, and they're, they're, they're celebrating, and what happens is during their party, 
He gets this idea to go and to take all the the cups and the vessels that were used in the temple in Jerusalem in order to honor and worship God. He said, let's have a party with those. So they go and they get all the cups and the chalices. And as they're continuing in their party and they're worshiping their false gods and they're celebrating and they're having a great time, suddenly this hand appears and starts writing on the wall. And everybody's kind of freaked out by this. I'll be honest, I would 100% be in the freaked out crowd. It's just not like, it's a a literal hand. A hand just starts writing on the wall out of nowhere. The king is perplexed. The people are perplexed. And his mindset is, hey, we got to get someone to interpret this. And this is where Daniel comes into play. So if you have your Bibles and you want to look, we're going to look. We're going to start with Daniel chapter 5. Verses 24 through 28, they've had the party, the hand has shown up, it's writing on the wall, and we're going to start here and work backwards just a little bit. Because Daniel is able to interpret what this means, and this is what it says in Daniel chapter 5, verses 24 through 28. Then the hand was sent from him, and this inscription was written out. Now this is the inscription that was written out. Mene, mene, tekel. Upharsin. This is the interpretation of the message. Mene, God has numbered your kingdom and put an end to it. The tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found deficient. And Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Can we pray again this morning? Father God, we're grateful so far as we've been here to, to experience the service today as we've lifted up your name in song, we've watched our kids celebrate and praise with us, our new friends who are joining us in ministry. God, thank you for being a faithful God. Thank you for being a God that uh, is, is active and real and relational. And God, it's so awesome that you've called us to experience this kingdom life with you, but also together with each other here. So help us this morning, help us to remove whatever uh, blocks might be in the way, whatever's distracting us, our thoughts, our, our fears, our worries, anxieties, to, to just leave it at your feet this morning as we look at your justice. As we look at this example, God, that we would find something that we could just hold on to that would encourage us, and also something, God, that would challenge us to live more for you. So Father, we ask these things in your name, amen. I wanted to start here this morning, way near the end of Daniel chapter 5, to build the foundation that this is a perfect example of a justice standard that already exists. And the neat thing about it is it exists regardless of what our thoughts, feelings, and actions are about it. And not only is there a justice standard, but it also tells us that it is intrinsically linked to a judge. So if we're, we're starting off, here's truth number one for today, that God sets the standard for justice. I got some verses here from Psalms chapter 111, verses 7 and 8, and it says this, The works of his hands are truth and justice. All his precepts are trustworthy. They're upheld forever and ever, and they are performed in truth and uprightness. Also in Psalm chapter 89, verses 11 through 14, it says, The heavens are yours, the earth also is yours, the world and all it contains. You have established them, the north, the south. You have created them. Tabar and Hermon, shout for joy at your name. You have a strong arm. Your hand is mighty. Your right hand is exalted. And look at what it says at the end. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne." That mercy and truth go before you. And what this reveals to us is that justice is an essential element of God's character. All that God does is just. All that he thinks, all that he determines, all that he declares is just. When he acts, it's just. Everything that God does, everything that he has established is built on justice. And it's measured according to his standard. So this is where we tend to get ourselves in trouble, is when we think about justice, but we don't want to attach God's standard to it, we want to attach ours. I want to share something here, because the problem that comes with this is we try to play a larger role in determining what's right and wrong, 
Who can punish and who can't? I don't know if you've ever heard of the Innocence Project. Um, I've said a number of times, if you know me, I love the true crime documentaries. Some of them feature the Innocence Project. And really what the Innocence Project is, the Innocence Project works to free innocent or to prevent wrongful convictions to create a fair, compassionate, and equitable system of justice for everyone. I think we can hear that and go, I'm on board with that. So this organization was established in 1992, and in 1993, they had their first experience in the courts trying to, to work to get uh, people exonerated. And I just want to share some of the stats. This is since 1993. 3,777 collective years innocent people have spent in jail. 243 people have been exonerated of crimes that they didn't commit. 34, 34 out of 50 states have exonerees. On average, an innocent person has spent 16 years in prison. This is not a political statement. This is for us to realize simply this. You might be thinking, what's the point? Even in our best attempt, the human systems of justice are flawed. Regardless of how you feel about it, this is the truth of it. Why? Because we're flawed people. It's, 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 it's not only limited by our, our finite understandings, but in some cases, it's also heavily influenced by the wrong things. How we feel justice should be poured out or how we feel a a, a decision should be made. It's not always impacted by God's standard. So that's a problem. But what we see as God as our judge is this, that God's standards of justice are absolute. They're pure. They're untainted by human frailties. So if, if truth one is simply that God sets the standard for justice, then this moves us to truth number two, that God judges all things fairly. Let's look at James chapter 4, verse 12. James writes, There's only one lawgiver and judge, and the one who is able to save and to destroy, but who are you judging your neighbor? That's a fun question. And I have this question all the time with my kids, especially now, because Evangeline has a heightened sense of justice. She's five. And justice to a five-year-old is much different than justice to a 41-year-old. Every time someone does something sarcastic or snarky or Taryn doesn't put the dishes away when she's asked or Avery says something rude, she needs a spank. You should ground her. Look, Joe, whoa, patience, easy here. It's just dishes. Take a break. But can I tell you, this happens to us. So the question here is, so what is it that sets this judge apart? I have spent some time reading through the Psalms, and man, the book of Psalms is an incredible uh, resource for your mental health. It's an incredible resource to understand the character and nature of God. It's, it's, It's so packed full of theology, and it's written so beautifully and poetically, and it reveals so much about us and our broken, fallen state, and it reveals so much more about the righteousness of God and His holiness and His justice. And in Psalm chapter 9, this is a declaration of praise. It's a declaration of gratitude to God about His judgment, about His protection, about His deliverance. And the, the overarching theme of this entire psalm is found right here in the middle of Psalm chapter 9, verses 7 and 8. It says, But the Lord sits as King forever that he has established his throne for judgment, and he will judge the world in righteousness. And this is what I love about this verse, this last part of verse 8. He will execute judgment for the peoples fairly. I want to present to you this morning that we have an untouchable judge. And the reason I used untouchable in italics is because I love the movie The Untouchables. It's one of my favorite movies. 
Costner's in it, all kinds of different guys. De Niro's in it. I mean, it's just packed full of great actors, great movie. Near the, I guess midway, maybe near the end, they've arrested Capone's bookie. He's on trial and the prosecutor is saying, is it your intent to go through the ledger and to decipher it and give us the names and the codes? And he's like, yeah, it is. It's going to be perfect. And then if you've seen the movie, there's Capone's number one henchman, the guy in the white suit. I mean, he looked like he was coming from Belmont. He's sharp. And he, he, he is in the courtroom, and he gets a piece of paper, and he goes to leave, and they see that there's a gun in his jacket. So Ness, Kevin Costner, uh, says to the bailiff, hey, he's got a gun. He can't have a gun. So he leaves the courtroom, and he finds the guy. They find the paper. There's a whole bunch of stuff that happens in between. But what they realize is that as they open the paper, there's a list of all the jurors' names and how much money they've been paid during this case. Al Capone's going to walk. So Ness meets with the judges. He meets with the prosecutors. And the judge is like, this has nothing to do with the case. It's inadmi- you, know, you can't admit it to evidence. We don't know what the basis is. You could have made it up. It doesn't matter. So he leaves, and the judge and Ness have a brief conversation. We don't know what that conversation is. But as he comes out, there's a tension. There's the close-up of, of Ness, and his face is all he's into it. The judge is looking nervous. And finally, the judge says, Bailiff, go into the other courtroom and bring in the jury. We're swapping the juries. And everybody's like, what? This is crazy. Capone's freaking out. The prosecutors are celebrating. And the prosecutor turns around and he says to Ness, what did you say to him? And he says, I told him his name was in the ledger. What? Now, we don't know if it was or not, but it was enough for us to understand. When we look at it in comparison to this, we have an untouchable judge who is not tainted, not just by human frailty, but he's not tainted by our human frailty. We can't bribe him. We can't force him to do anything. We can't threaten him. He's an untouchable judge. And this is why it's so important to understand. Why does God set the standard? God sets the standard. Because he sets the standard, he's the judge. Because God's standard of justice is built on his character and his nature We can understand that when he declares something, when we face consequences, that no matter what happens, our consequences, sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad, but nothing happens without God knowing. So if if, if God's standard of justice is built on his character and nature, that we can trust this. When he determines and when the consequences are handed out, that we know that God blesses or punishes as he desires. Sometimes when we hear the word consequence, we think it's always bad. Bad consequences. My daughter was a real little Avery when she was in class, and she was a teacher, and she was uh, teaching her little stuffed animals and her toys, and they're not listening. I don't know how you determine that your stuffed animals are not listening in class, but she was able to do it, and she would look at them, and she would go, do you want consequences? And I'm like, oh, my word. I think she was like maybe kindergarten or younger, but I'm like, in in my mind, I'm like, she gets consequences. She can understand justice. It's amazing when we start to understand these concepts and precepts. We're going to look at 2 Peter here in just a minute, but it's interesting how we've been talking about the exiles and, and the church and how it impacts us now. And I look at 2 Peter, and 2 Peter is writing to a group of Christians in the early church who are, who are fighting against culture. They're fighting against false teaching. They're, they're fighting against a deteriorating moral climate that they're living in in the New Testament church. And this is what he writes in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. But do not let this one fact escape your notice. He says, Beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Despite what we might perceive as a delay, when it comes to God's timing, we have to understand it's different than ours. His standard is different than ours. His ruling is different than ours. His judgment is different. It's built 
on perfection. It's built on righteousness. It's built on holiness. So what we can understand, if all of these things are true, then we know that when God chooses to reward or punish, He also chooses as quickly as it happens or as slowly as it happens. I have some examples of that. And I want you to, to, to think this morning as, as we talk about this type of element from justice and judging and punishment. Not every punishment is like instant and like sudden death. Wouldn't it be something if it were? Like think about Ananias and Sapphira in the New Testament church where they came in and they, they lied about the land that they sold and the money that they gave and like immediately like, okay, you're dead. And then the next one comes in and they're like, well, you have a chance to do the right thing. And nope. Okay, well, you're dead. What would, it, what would our lives look like? This is a rabbit trail. I'm sorry, Christine. But what would our lives look like if we lived a little bit more of the mindset of, okay, righteous judge who judges quickly and maybe, maybe a little bit more severe than what we would consider? I don't know. I Listen. I want to look at just a few examples of slow punishment, fast punishment, delayed punishment. Genesis chapter 19, you don't have to turn there. This is the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. And how God's judgment is stretched out over time as Abraham is like crying out, God, please, I'll find 50, I'll find two, I'll find one, I'll find someone righteous, please don't destroy the city. And it still gets destroyed. And God says, listen, make sure Lot understands they need to leave. He sends messengers to Lot to tell them, get out of the city, leave the city, don't look back, just get away. And as they're leaving the city and destruction and chaos is happening, Lot's wife turns around to look back and she turns into a pillar of salt. Now, depending on what version you read, you might find different words about what it was that was really looking back. I was looking at the Amplified uh, version, and, and they called it a direct act of disobedience against God and God's messengers. Hmm, interesting. But also, that direct act was linked to an unfulfilled longing for the culture that had influenced her. You can fast forward to Numbers chapter 20. If you're familiar with this, here's the recap. Moses is in the wilderness. The people are freaking out because it's a desert. There's no water. They're upset. Moses, you brought us out here to die. You brought us out here to kill all our livestock. We don't have any water. What's going on? And God says, go tell the rock, speak to it, and what's going to happen? Water's going to come out. And Moses, in his frustration, gets up and he looks at the people and he's like, you rebellious knuckleheads. That's the Timmy paraphrase. And he strikes the rock twice and water comes out. But here's God going, I didn't tell you to do that. Your anger and your lack of self-control. This is what God says to Moses. You did not trust. You did not treat me as holy. Whew. Ben talked about Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 4. He had an entire year to wrestle with his pride. An entire year to try to get that under control. Daniel said, you have a year. Turn back to God. Repent. Judgment is coming. You know what's going to happen. He knew what was coming. It wasn't like, well, I wonder how God's going to punish me. He knew you're going to be wandering around like a beast in the wilderness. Turn to God. And exactly, like one year later, here's Nebuchadnezzar going, man, look at at everything I've done. Pride. In Daniel chapter 5, Belshazzar meets a swift and a pretty immediate punishment. Chapter 5, verse 30, after Daniel has given his deliverance of this is what the writing on the wall means. This is what happens. That same night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed. And in comes Darius, the new king, the king of Persia, which we'll hear about in two weeks. So come back next week, 
and hear a special Father's Day presentation. And then Pastor Dennis will be back to finish off this portion of Daniel. But here we see all throughout Scripture, there is no way to figure out, well, how does God punish? When does God punish? Listen, we don't know. I don't know. But if I can build on these precepts, what I can understand is God is just, He is fair, and He has built His punishments and His blessings on those things. So I want to go back quickly and just take a look at this story a little bit more. So we, like I said, we, we've determined truth number one, God sets the standard of justice. Truth number two, God judges fairly. And truth number three is that God blesses and punishes as he determines. So I want to look at Belshazzar and his, his sin. What was it that got him in hot water? I have it up on the screen for you. This is taken from the message. Sometimes the message is really good and a good paraphrase for some narratives. This is a narrative story. So this is what it says. King Belshazzar held a great feast for his 1,000 nobles. The wine flowed freely. Belshazzar, heedy with the wine, ordered that the gold and silver chalices his father Nebuchadnezzar had stolen from God's temple of Jerusalem be brought in so that he and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines could drink from them. And when the gold and silver chalices were brought in, the king and his nobles and his wives and his concubines drank wine from them. They drank the wine and drunkenly praised their gods made of gold, silver, bronze, and iron, wood, and stone. This, to us, it's not pride, maybe a little. It's not anger. Maybe it's a little bit of a lack of self-control. It's, it's, it's definitely a longing for some type of cultural, some, some pattern for sin. But what Belshazzar is found guilty of is taking these chalices from God's temple and using them in his party to worship false gods and idols. There is a phrase for that. Belshazzar is guilty of profaning the sacred. So what does that mean? Well, let's just break it down. To profane the sacred means this. It means to treat something that is considered holy, sacred, or set apart with disrespect, irreverence, or disregard. Desecrating or treating something sacred in a manner that is inappropriate, offensive, or disrespectful. Do we do this when our thoughts, feelings, and actions towards whatever it is that God has declared as sacred when it shows a lack of reverence or honor towards something that, that God has specifically said, this is sacred to me. This is holy to me. This is something that I have designed and dedicated purpose to. And there's a number of things in our life. I just picked four for sake of time, and it's not an, exhaust, an exhaustive list. But here are some of the things that God has declared as sacred and holy that sometimes we have a hard time not profaning. And one is this, people. Every person alive is created in the image of God. They're image bearers, broken, flawed, sinners, repentant. It doesn't matter. What happens? We profane the sacred when we abuse and mistreat people. Something else that God has declared as sacred, the church. The church has been called to live in a, a unity with Christ, to, to live in, in sacrifice of, in love and to, to honor and worship and, and praise and to, to meet the needs and to, to let the Holy Spirit work in our lives. And sometimes we have a disregard for that. We pray about it almost every single Sunday. God, help us to get this right. Help us to understand worship. Because if worship is directly attached to what we do here and what we do in our lives, we can easily profane worship when we make things all about us, when we mistreat the people around us, when we use the church or people in the church for our own gain. There's a lot when we start to kind of look at these level by level. Here's something else, and this is, I'm telling you why I picked these four things, because I think that these four things are really what our culture is struggling right now in the most. Treating people with dignity and respect seems real simple, but if you go on social media, not so much. Attitudes towards the church, attitudes within the church, 
how we treat each other, how we treat the Holy Spirit, how we look at God. Here's another thing that God has declared as sacred, marriage and family. It's not just a, a culture that has a disregard for marriage and family. Some uh, Listen, statistics don't lie. And based on statistics, there are people sitting in this room that are struggling in their marriage, that are struggling in their family, that are not honoring what they have vowed, what they have committed to, what they have said to stand before God and say, I am taking this vow to love, to honor, to cherish, to submit, to whatever, to, to be sacrificial. It doesn't matter. We're willing to put our neck out there, so to speak. We're profaning our marriage. We're, we're, we're misusing or abusing or mistreating our children. I have to be very careful of this because I, I, I have a tendency to be very, um, hmm. I, you know, this is how dishes get done. This is how dishes get put away. And I don't want to, 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 to make it about doing something as silly as dishes, but that attitude, that like I'm in control, what I say goes, you don't have a say in this, that can destroy my kids. I gotta be careful. We have to be careful. But here's the last thing when it comes to profaning the sacred your individual self. You are a temple. The Holy Spirit is dwelling inside of you. And that is your personal attitude towards sin, your personal behavior, your personal sin patterns. And it's fine, worship team, you can come up. You guys can start playing. Again, this is not designed to be an exhaustive list. This is just to kind of kickstart us into thinking, okay, what are the things in my life that I'm profaning that are sacred? Because I'm going to go out on a limb here, and I'm going to say, I don't think there's anybody in here that has a silver or gold chalice from the temple in Jerusalem that you're using at home for the Super Bowl party. If I'm wrong, I want to come to your Super Bowl party and see it. So when we bridge that gap, that's what we have to look at. What has God declared sacred and how are we profaning it? The Holy Spirit might be pushing on you in some way. I'm not sure what that is. I don't know. It may be causing us to think of, of what it means in life to stand before a righteous and holy judge. I gave you three truths. God sets the standard. God's the judge. God judges fairly. Here's two more truths that you don't have on your note sheet. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13 says, And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him, of whom, of, of, of him to whom we are must answer. Romans chapter uh, 14, verses 10 through 12 says, but as for you, why do you judge your brothers or sisters? Or as uh, are you as well, why do you regard your brother or sister with contempt? For we will all appear before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord to me, every knee will bow and every tongue will give praise to God. So then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. You are not going to miss your appointment with the judge. It will happen. You may be experiencing judgment in your life now. You may be heading down a direction where you are profaning something that God has declared sacred in your life and you are facing, you are up against consequences, you're up against punishment, you're up against dealing with the Holy Spirit as God is trying to say, hey, open your eyes, listen, repent come back. There's restoration. There's redemption. There's love. There's grace. There's mercy. Because here's what I want everybody to leave with today. That God's love is on display through his judgment. And we can trust that his consequences are designed to foster an intimate relationship with us. God's love and judgment go together hand in hand. God is, is not 100% full of wrath, but he's also not 100% full of love. He's 100% full of both. You can't have one without the other. And in our mind, we look at it and go, this makes no sense, Pastor Tim. How on earth can this make sense? 
It's like uh, the comedian that talks about shampoo and conditioner. No, it's not. It can't be all of one or all of the other. It's two different things. They don't do the same thing. They don't act the same way. God's not a shampoo bottle. Here's what D.A. Carson, if you know who he is, he's one of the founders of the Gospel Coalition. I love this quote. This is from a book that he writes called The Difficult Doctrine of the Love of God. This is his quote. There is nothing intrinsically impossible about the wrath of God and love being directed towards the same people at the same time. God in his perfections must be wrathful against his rebel image bearers. Rebel image bearer. But then he says this, for they have offended him. But God in his perfections must be loving toward his rebel image bearers, for he is that kind of God. I'm going to invite you to stand as we we start to close out this morning and we sing. I want you to think, over the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about exile. We've been talking about the sins of the nations of Babylon. We've been talking about some of Israel's issues. But this morning, as we sing, I want you to think, where are you in your life? What are the things that are, are pushing you towards punishment? What things are pushing you towards judgment? Are you fighting God's judgment? Are you finding that, that God is calling to you to restore something that's broken? We have room on the sides. We have room up here. We have people that will pray with you, pray for you. We'll leave you alone if you choose. That's fine too. But I'm calling you this morning to consider what is it? How is it that I can live in both God's love and his judgment and grow? What do I need to do to change? Let's sing. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days have been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up till I lay my head, I will sing. Of the goodness of God For all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire. Darkest night, you're close like no For all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the good As we get ready to sing, and Ben's going to close this in prayer, the, the Old Testament is built on God's judgment being revealed. And, you know, God's judgment on the nations points to the salvation of his chosen people. And this all comes to a climax in the person of Christ. Example after example is noted all throughout human failure and all throughout history that there is always been a continual call to repentance and redemption and restoration. And I was looking at Ezekiel this week trying to 
kind of build some more background on the Babylonian exile in Jeremiah and Isaiah. And it's amazing all the things that these prophets had to say about this. And in Ezekiel, there's this vision that he has where he's drawn up into the temple. And he's with God, and, and they're watching as the people are, are in the temple, and they're worshiping other gods, and their behavior is just absolutely atrocious. It's offensive to God, and God just finally says, you know what? I'm done here. And he packs up his glory, and he packs up his majesty, and he just pulls out of the temple, and he leaves these people in total chaos. And he says, I cannot dwell in this place. And as Ezekiel's going through this vision, he looks and there's, here's this like Godmobile that's up on the mountain and it's, it's, it's happening that this judgment is being poured out and, and people are heading into exile. In his departure, the people are left to face judgment for their behavior. This consequence is directly linked to what we've been talking about the last five or six weeks. And even though that God has packed up everything and that God has moved out of the temple, there's something really extraordinary that takes place in this vision. The people's actions, their thoughts, their feelings, they had become so blatantly offensive to God that he packed up everything. But he didn't abandon his people. Because what happens in Ezekiel's vision is as the, the, the exiles are being carried into Babylonia, and guess what God does? God takes all of his glory and all of his majesty, and he follows his people into exile. And he tells Ezekiel, I am going to dwell in Babylon with my people. I, I can't think of a better picture of what a righteous fair, loving, merciful judges than, than a God who does not forget his promises. For a God that does not forget his people. For a God that continues to deliver, even in their wickedness, even in their attitude, in their behavior, it didn't matter. The temple was not something God could dwell in, but he could still stay with his people. And whatever it is this morning that you are experiencing that has kept you from experiencing that relationship with God, let it go. Give it up. He's still fighting with you. He's still struggling with you. He's still calling you to repentance. And here's what's really awesome. The whole purpose of God staying with his people, staying in Babylon. God is in exile with his people. Why? Because his plan is still in motion. His plan to restore, his plan to redeem, his plan to bring in this new covenant that we get to experience through God's love and justice wrapped perfectly together with the cross. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, absorbs that wrath, that punishment that we're responsible for. And he does so out of an act of love. The cross is proof that what seems like dead end judgment is simply the fulfillment of God's love magnified into eternity. In just a minute, we're going to start. We're going to sing the chorus again. We're going to finish that song. You have time. Please, I am imploring you. If there's anything that is stopping you from experiencing this true love. Embrace it. Come to Christ. We'll, we'll tell you what it means to trust Christ. We'll tell you what it means to, to understand the act of cross, the, to, to understand what it means to be a disciple and to walk forward, to live in freedom. Because ultimately, that's what God's punishment is intended to do, to bring us into that right relationship with him so that we can walk in freedom. And we can do that because of Christ. Let's sing. For all my life you've been faithful. For all my life you have been faithful. For all my life you have been so, so Yeah. 
sing that first verse again. Could you put that up? I keep looking at the line, your mercy never fails me. We just read a thing on there about the, the rebel, the rebel image bearer. If you didn't think that that was you in this room, I'd like to talk to you after. Because every one of us has sin in our lives. Every one of us rebels. Every one of us at times pushes away from God and says, I got this. I can do this. But his mercy and grace never fails us. Let's just sing that first verse again because I just want to. God's telling me to. Love you, Lord. Will oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days have been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you've been faithful. And all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after us. Your mercy never fails. You are that God that keeps his promise. We are grateful. We are thankful that you are just and you are good. Because God, everything that we have, we don't deserve. We deserve death. And yet your grace and your mercy change that. I want to say thank you. We want to say thank you. We love you, and help us always to sing of the goodness of God. We thank you. We praise you. 
We give you glory. In Jesus' name.